I have worked at really big companies and really small companies, and um, you know, my time as a research analyst was really instructive because I, you know, had this opportunity to meet. You know, this was at the time when banking and research separated, so I was functionally an investment banker. So my job, in many ways, was to go out and meet with private company after private company and private company to figure out which ones were actually going to be successful IPOs. And so through that process, I started to develop an extraordinary you know, pattern recognition for you know, what do these companies look like small? What do they look like at scale? Which business models work? What is the margin profile of this business model versus that business model? And um, what I really re you know, got to recognize was that you know, if you come up and you've worked at one or two companies, you might have, you know, you might have that as your, your basis for your knowledge. But here, I had this huge benefit of hundreds of companies, truly, that I could kind of put into this anecdote set, and, and that's where I kind of, you know, I'm, I kind of, if you look at my career, it's, it is very nonlinear, and, and I've kind of gone into a bunch, a bunch of different stages. And through that, um, I've kind of got to get a sense of some things that I've, I've kind of learned along the way. So uh, Ha asked me to come speak, and, and again, I ha I've never actually, I've kind of assembled a set of thoughts here. I've never actually given this presentation before, so give me feedback. But I also love to make things super uh, interactive. So if there's things that come up along the way, or you're confused, just raise your hand. We'll make this uh, super fun. So I assume that uh, most of the people in the room are somewhere between these two poles, uh, between a seed and a unicorn. Um, and you know, I have, I have witnessed along the pathway. And if you're closer to the seed end of the spectrum, uh, you know, your sets of problems are very, very different, most likely, as to whether or not you're, you're at the unicorn end of the spectrum. And I like to say that there's really kind of two phases of a company. And Jeff talked about this a little bit. There's that initial phase, which is just getting that core product market fit. And you know, Spiro probably spends a lot of its time thinking about that and focusing on that. And you, as an entrepreneur, are spending a ton of time thinking about that. However, uh, you know, that, that original product market fit only gets you so far, uh, is what you find. And so the other phase of a company, I like to call it, is, is scaling through invisible asymptotes. And invisible asymptotes is not mine. Uh, I'll fully give credit to Eugene Wei, who is a, uh, an early Amazon guy. But it, it was a really simple expression for dealing with you know, a lot of the things that I saw throughout my careers, both working at uh, big companies and small companies. So, this is uh, you know, what, what he would describe it as, which is uh, you know, this, 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 this line that you continue to run into and saying, OK, I'm going to continue to make my product better along this axis of you know, this, this you know, fixed goal, if you will. And certainly at my time at OpenTable, uh, that was what the company had been doing. You know, essentially, we stood for fine dining, occasion-based, reservation-taking, white tablecloth restaurants. Great, fabulous. And we were optimizing to that experience. There's a big problem, however. <laughs> when I got there, I found out that we were 60% uh, penetrated on that market. I was like, oh, well, there goes the growth. And, there, and that's you know, one of the reasons why I even came in, because the growth had indeed started to flatten out. And if you start thinking about these S-curves that you're hopping on, at some point you start hitting a shoulder and you go, oh, that, that growth isn't what I thought it was anymore. And oftentimes, the assessment of TAM is the most critical piece of your business. So you're starting out, you're doing this product market fit, product market fit. OK, how do I get there? How do I get there? How do I get there? And then you get there, and you're like, this is fantastic. And then all of a sudden, it's like, ah, record scratch. We're not growing as fast as we used to. Did we assess the size of the market for the specific product that I was delivering as effectively as I possibly could? And so one of the things that I often talk about in, in order to find these you know, growth trajectories that you know, continue on going, which is redefine and expand the TAM. So um, these were also taken as, uh, from Ben Thompson, so I'll give him credit for it. But you know, a lot of this was, was looking at Amazon. And when they looked at it and said, gosh, you know, free shipping was going to be a limitation to growth, let's 
offer that up, and we're going to go into many, many, many new markets. So in our case, uh, free, you know, at OpenTable, expanding the TAM met, meant looking at a couple things. One, looking at different kinds of restaurants. We saw in our data, top 10 search query was P.F. Chang's. I was like, shoot, you know, people know, like, we're at Banu and, you know, all these fancy restaurants, and P.F. Chang's is a top 10 search query. And so what it was telling to us was our diners were looking for more everyday casual dining offerings. And we had a stipulation, though, that, you know, you had to be a reservation-taking restaurant. One clear way to expand the TAM for us was to go beyond the reservation. Start looking at more casual, everyday dining. So reimagining our TAM beyond just reservation taking to essentially waitlist walk-in type restaurants. The other thing we looked at was how people were using us. So a reservation historically stood for, oh, okay, you know, I know my anniversary is coming up. Hopefully, you all know what that date is, so you know what the, the actual time is, and you and you you know go in advance and, and make this reservation. Great. Well, we found that people were starting to make 25% on the app anyway. We're making reservations within uh, 90 minutes of seating time. That's not a reservation anymore. That's a homing beacon and of what's available and around me right here, right now. So we started looking at occasions and saying, OK, for that near me now dining experience. We also saw that travelers, anyone who would used us in two cities or more, had by far our highest frequency rate. So we started looking at, OK, looking at traveler use case. So we looked at different use cases of our experience. The third thing we looked at was different geographies. This is a classic example, and I think a lot of companies who um, are thinking early should think about what that global use case is early so that you don't end up with what I ended up with at OpenTable, <laughs> which was a very legacy set of uh, challenges, which was, uh, you know, when I got there, there was a different app in every single market. The search backends didn't talk to each other, so if I searched in New York for a London restaurant, I 404 No contemplation had ever been given to being a global company. So thinking about geographic expansion. And then the final thing that we did, you know, again, to not bump into this crest of, of, of TAM was really thinking about uh, business model and business model fit. And one of the things I would encourage all of you is, is the business model is as important to that original product market fit or the expansion of that product market fit as anything else. And so along that journey, uh, if you're doing a good job and you are expanding your TAM, you're seeing growth. This is fantastic. Well, this is also what I call the exponential curve of breakage. And so what this chart shows is um, the employee count. And by the way, I have another. It's, it's a log chart. I'll go back. But uh, it actually is very predictable and very linear if you look at it on a log scale. But kind of going back here. Um, this is an employee count. I'll say from zero to 50 people is your founding experience. So how many people here have you know, fewer than 50 people? So all, all, all of you. OK, so this is all, this is in front of you. This is your future if you're successful. <laughs> and you manage that product market fit into additional uh, spaces, into additional industries. So when I joined Playdom, uh, it was about 150 people. So we were basically right at Dunbar's number. And if you don't know Dunbar's number, this is the number of people that you can hold in your head uh, in terms of relationships. So when people have 2,000 Facebook friends, that's a farce. You, you just can't. The, the human being can only have about 150 people that you actually kind of know. And if you, you know, if, as everybody here has probably read, read Sapiens, the thing that made humans humans is the fact that we could actually organize ourselves beyond 150 people. And so the, 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 the notion of organizing beyond 150 people, it means that you have to tell, you know, as Jeff talked about, you know, you know th these are selling or it's myth and legend and narrative about your company. Otherwise known, in my opinion, as culture. But anyway, there's another breaking point. Uh, so, so, it uh, so it played on my joint at 150 people, and it was breaking all over the place. Uh, we didn't have HR systems. People were being offboarded. There were salary histories that were like, you know, being, we didn't have an HRIS. It was being held in an Excel spreadsheet. Now there's like, you know, software tools for all these, but this is 2009. It was like in the dark ages of, 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 of founding companies. So, um, we were on this massive growth tear. We acquired eight companies in eight months. I remember one Monday starting 32 people and going, holy crap, we are breaking. Eight months later, we were 600 people. 
and uh, we we'd only doubled revenue. But we were basically at this like 500 person and I you know level, and I saw us breaking again. Um, I've now been inside of companies. Uh, my you know, you know open table is about 1,150 people. Um, but when I was at Disney, you know, we were part of a larger group that was about 2,000 people. I saw us break again. And I've had the benefit of being in a very, very large company like the Walt Disney Company, uh, which is 90,000 people, but, but, but seeing what happens almost in an anthropological context of what happens of how do you organize people at that size. You know, Jeff talked about uh, John Donahoe mentioning like managing the army. And at, you know, 90,000 people, it's just a different, different schematic. And the reason why you know, these, these different sta stages um, cause that is what's happening is the decision trees fan out and how you used to get stuff done radically changes. How you communicate radically changes. And so you know, I've kind of, and, and one of the things that's uh, notable in here is how many managers are in your company at each of those phases. And if you look at the IPO phase or that, that larger phase of company, now your, your managers are beyond the Dunbar number. Like you, you have managers of managers and managers, and so now this, this whole thing starts to fan out, and it gets a whole lot more complicated. And you used to be like, oh, I could just like put everybody on the Slack channel. We didn't have Slack back in 2009, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, you can manage via Slack almost, or grab people in a room and get it done. And like, you know, I was saying like that, that, that pulse of you know, getting everybody around, but if you're successful, you're gonna start hitting some of these challenges and breakpoints. So I'm going to uh, read Conway's law here, which is organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Essentially, how you talk ends up getting backward integrated and reflected in your product. And I saw this at OpenTable. So we had a restaurant group and we had a di you know, diner group. So everybody knows about the, the, the diner product that we have. Hopefully you all have it. You can you know, hit the app and get the, uh, you know, hit the button and get the reservation. Many people don't realize that we're really a B2B to C company. So we put software inside of restaurants to really drive marketing operations and hospitality. And what was interesting was that the organization had split into two. And from a archite technical architectural standpoint, never the two shall meet, <laughs> truly. Um, so if I wanted to create a hospitality solution that would go from what the consumer experience was all the way to what showed up in the restaurant, it was almost impossible to do. And so we really became a reflection of how the organization communicated. And one of the things that I went in and did was actually push those back together. And what I realized was I had to, we had to go all the way literally into the code to make that something that was possible so that we could be agile. And so start thinking about what are those communications that you're doing and making sure that you're, you're thinking about them in a way that, that has, and, and recognizing that you're gonna have deep implications further on down the road if you don't think about the impact from some of these things. And so here's some of the tips that I've, I've come about for handling some of these situations. Um, I call it reactive leaning in. Uh, one of the things that uh, engineers hate is banal process. So if you come in and you're like, okay, we're gonna put a process in for this, that, and the other, they're gonna like hate you forever. And so I would just wait for things to maybe not go so well. Uh, and, and one of the things that is inevitable if you're growing is that you are gonna break. I always say like, like, a, like a snake shedding its skin, you have to break in order to grow. And so the thing that you should be doing is looking for the bricks. Like when are things just falling apart? When are things having uh, an issue? Because it's really an exciting opportunity. It means you're sitting in that hyper growth state and you look and say, okay, what's happening? And then more importantly, how do you post-mortem? The other important thing is the line between fixer and finder, finder and fixer here. Uh, one of the things that I found was that my horizontal purview people uh, were really good at finding these breaks. And what I mean by that is it's my head of finance, it's the head of HR, if you have that person. <laughs> uh, it's the general counsel, it's anyone who has, it's your COO if you have one, it's yourself, uh, who, who has vision across the organization. Oftentimes, this person is not going to be the one who can fix it. So making sure that you're not requiring people in your organization to say, don't bring, bring me a problem unless you've got a solution. No, bring the problems, because that's how you're going to get to the point where you're in a position for fixing. I think there's also some questions that you should be asking inside your organization. 
How many first-time managers do you have? It is not uncommon. Certainly, at Playden, we were we were uh, we had a lot of field promotions. You know, something we were growing. When you're adding that many people that fast, all of a sudden it's like, hey, you managed somebody today, uh, and this person might have been an extraordinary individual contributor, but they had no idea how to do a one-on-one. -on -one. They had no idea how to give radically candid feedback. And I'm a huge uh, student of radical candor, by the way. We became the uh, poster child for Kim Scott's book uh, on radical candor. But they had no idea how to do that. They, they couldn't give a performance review. Um, so making sure that you know, what percentage of your managers are first time managers, but how many people are, are they actually functionally managing? How quickly can a manager give you the status on their operation? You know, I'd be in a meeting and I'd ask just a simple question, I thought, and it was like, ah, uh, I don't know the answer to that. And then they'd go away and it would took them a long time to find the answer to those questions. Uh, that's a problem. You know, people should be dashboarding up their life. They should know what business they're running. They should have the ability to, in a minute, if, if it's even writing their own SQL queries, be able to pull up the information in a relatively short period of time. And if they can't do that, something, if it hasn't broken already, it's about to break. You know, example of this, when I was at Nextdoor, we had, you know, it was one of those things where top line metrics, had, you know, it took about three or four weeks for it to show up in the top line metrics, but essentially something had broken off in terms of how uh, invitations were sent throughout the neighborhoods, and that wasn't known or found because people were not on top of their numbers. Another question is, how many leaders in your organization are in the largest role they've ever had? This is probably one of the most heartbreaking parts of being in a startup that's growing fast. Because it's often the person who took you from 0 to 50 is not the person who can take you from 50 to 150. And the person who took you from 50 to 150 can't take you to 500. And some people can run the gamut. Some people are you know, unicorns that can leap through all this stuff. Most cannot. And so you have to recognize like this, this, this may be too much. And it may be too much for that person. And the kind thing is to move on. And you have to be somewhat you know, on the one hand, ruthless, but these are often culture bearers inside the organization. So something else to think about. And then another question is how, how we're setting goals. And I, I, I put some of my own thoughts on goal setting on the next slide here. Um, as you get bigger and bigger, you, you, you've got to keep it. It's almost like the inverse correlation. As you get bigger, the simpler the messages need to get. I try to keep uh, to the organization three to five goals. The other thing that I um, spent a lot of time on was making sure I understood how many of our people were focused on each goal. And so I have in here, and we're, we're all familiar with Horizon 1, Horizon 2, Horizon 3. Most of our, you know, I mean, look, in order to get to Horizon 2, you need to cross Horizon 1. So you need to make sure a decent percentage of your people are running and driving the business for the next three-month metrics, right? So you need to make sure that there's like, they're on that pathway. But, but the thing of a, an organization and what it will do, it will, it will, it will eat alive your Horizon 2 and Horizon 3, your investments. The thing that's going to, those, those are your additional TAM accelerators. These are your ways that you're going to continue to find and scale those new, new asymptotes. You've got to figure out ways to protect your Horizon 2 and 3 objectives and how you set benchmarks as associated with them. And then obviously ensuring tight and measurable KPIs. I can't tell you how often people are like, here's what we're going to do. And I was like, yeah, but it's the metric and getting people really honed in on making sure that they can have definable goals that they can measure. And then the final thing I'll just say here is what's your role? Now this first bullet, I'm going to break it apart a little bit. Um, the purpose. You know, when I first got to Open Table, I think we had gotten a little dis disconnected to the purpose. You know, we were there helping entrepreneurs grow and thrive, and they were putting food on their table by putting food on your table, making sure that everybody understood the, 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 the uniqueness of, of getting to the table. Certainly setting the vision. Uh, you know, where is this company headed? I've had a lot of CEOs going, God, it's really annoying. I told the company my vision. And then they're like, what's your vision? And I was like, I just told you what the vision was. And I was like, it's not that they're asking you what the vision is because they didn't hear you the first time. What they want to know is, do you still believe? Do you still believe that you can climb that mountain? And so the re-articulation of that vision over and over and over again, that it almost comes out of you in every single breath. And I also say, being a steward for the culture. One of the things I say all the time is like, this culture is not free lunch and foosball tables. It is how people make decisions when you are not in the room. 
Culture is the force multiplier for your business. It is the thing that, you know, it, it, can, it can radically change. So you, as CEOs, are not the culture, but you are the steward of the culture. What you choose to reward will be and help set the culture. And culture is a self-preservation organism. It wants to protect itself. <laughs> you need to tell that culture what is, what is safe and what is not safe inside your organization. And after you've done all that, it's just hire and sell. <laughs> it's truly as simple as that. And, and hiring, you've got to realize, as, as Jeff was talking about, you, you can't do it alone. You've got to get the people in the room. You've got to get them running. And then selling, I look at this as you got to be able to sell it outside, inside before you sell it outside. As much of our vision and where we're going and our purpose and ultimately our brand is really about how do people inside believe it? And if they get it and if they're behind our culture, vision, and mission, and strategy, then they're going to be in a pathway to do it. And I think I am out of time. I've never done this before. Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Right. Packing a lot in. I think I put my wrong Twitter handle on there. It might be CS Quarles. Anyway. <laughs> My, my question is, it seems like sometimes bringing, bringing employees on is a little bit like having the expectation of a tour of duty. Because if these yeah. leaders are going to be here, you know, for a very, or to fill a very specific goal for the company, then perhaps even hiring them with the expectation that this is what your tour of duty is, and then perhaps providing leadership skills or training or development and such to help them get over the the hump if those things change, but your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, and this is why I think it's very dangerous to talk about startup like it's a family, because you don't get rid of your family. Um, I love tours of duty, and in fact, more of the, the HR language is around um, almost, you know, a topographical map that you're continuing to uncover and, uh, you know, sort of get through the fog on. And, and similarly, it's like, okay, here's the mission. Should you choose to accept it? Here's what it is. And then to revisit it over time. And some people can do multiple tours of duty throughout the company, but it is, you know, I, even when I hire, I look at, you know, what are you good at, what do you like to do, and what does the company need you to do? And if all three of those sit on top of each other, magnificent, right? But, but if, if one of those gets out of alignment, right, like, you're good at something, you like to do it, company doesn't need you to do it anymore. We have a problem. And so how do we get you into a new space? And then you may go, oh, um, here's this new thing that the company needs me to do, but I really like doing that. Like even Jeff was talking about like the shuns, you know, the communication, the organization. Like if you don't like doing that, then you're going to go and it's, it's the kind thing for both sides to, to f figure out and find a way out. Um, I love the clarity around, you know, how you sort of uncovered the strategy at Open Table and the direction that you needed to go into. I'd love to have you unpack that a bit for us because oftentimes, you know, as a founder, you've 10 different fires, so many things you're trying to figure out, prioritize. You know, how did you kind of come to coming into an organization and figuring out, like, you know, it's this, this, and this? Um, well, I mean, I think it is about educating yourself. I mean, the, the one benefit of coming in, I was only CFO for three months. But you also, um, what I realized, the difference between C being CFO and being CEO is pretty dramatic in the sense that everyone lies to you when you're CEO. <laughs> I mean, not in a bad way, but just in a, like, they're, they're going to give their varnished version of the truth to you. And so you have to figure out how do you get truth tellers. And so I did skip, skip, skip levels to try and understand what was actually going on inside the organization, build the mosaic. Mul you know, com so, so it was sort of you know, anecdotal truth that I built mosaic around through skip, skip, skip levels. Then I spent some time looking at the data. And I'm, you know, everyone else believe, was a believe in God, everyone else bring data or whatever, the, the data, 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 data. And it was like, okay, the size of said opportunities are often very evident. And you know, I mean, maybe it's because I have a financial background and, and it's, it comes almost naturally to me to be able to then prioritize. And this is the thing that would get irritated 
from my vantage, or, you know, talking to product people, it's like, oh, look what we're going to do. And I go, well, what kind of impact would that have? And I was like, uh, well, it's really cool. And I was like, I don't care how cool something is. If you don't have a point of view on the magnitude of the impact, these are very, very vital engineering resources that we're going to put to use on something. i got to make sure that they're being put at highest, best use. Now, you're not always going to be right. You're going to like make a, you know, you're going to have, and this is why the forecasting or the, the, the goal setting is so important because you'll go in and say, okay, we're going to do this and here's what my estimate is. And then you go at the end of the quarter and you're like, wow, we were wrong. <laughs> and that's totally okay too. I mean, I think back to culture and then you go, well, why were we wrong? Why were we wrong? And so then it becomes a, a curiosity exercise of here's what my hypothesis is. Here's what the numbers came back at. We were completely wrong, but no, here's how we're iterating. So how do you get signal in the marketplace? Because I, you know, my head of HR made fun of me because like five of my values I talked about were essentially move faster. It was like, find the testable hypotheses, make it happen. Uh, you know, all these things and it was essentially like go get signal in the marketplace once we have data then we'll go back and we'll reiterate and it's fine and it's fine to be wrong just do it and do it in a, in a way that's it's expeditious okay one more question uh, all right melissa thank you very much thank you so much for this i'm curious when you're setting your horizons one two and three with a team so you've got to bring them clear objectives articulate them super clearly and then hold everyone to them. How far in advance do you start thinking about that? Who are you bringing into the room and when? Like what's the, how, how early does the prep process for the next quarter start or is your previous quarter spent preparing for the next one? Well, hopefully you don't spend a whole quarter thinking about that. Yeah, the I hope quarter. not yeah, either, but I'm just curious. Like, is, I, think, I think, you know, my job is certainly as CEO to, to be setting Horizon 3. Like this right. is where we're going. Like one of the things we wanted to become was more discovery oriented at Open Table. You know, we were essentially like you type in, you know, the name of a restaurant, you hit the restaurant, boom. But, you know, there was Yelp over there getting, you know, 10x the consumer traffic. So I wanted to become more discovery oriented and I had a, a view of how we we're going to get there. You know, there was sort of the, the horizon two of like, okay, this is what it looks like then. But then I looked at my product organization and my dev organization to say, like, come up with like, well, what are those things? Knowing that this is where we want to get to, what are the things we need to do this quarter? And so making sure that they're, they're on a pathway, um, you know, to, to, to getting there. In terms of the how, you know, I, I use my exec team as a foil. Like, I'm a very, um, I'm a verbal thinker. Uh, and I know that about myself. And so I needed, and I, you know, that's why radical candor is so important because I need them to test me. I need them to come back at me and be like, this is a stupid idea because of this. That. And then we would just, I call it push the clay. So we'd go and have a good scrap and have a good debate. And then we'd be able to then be in a position. So I required everybody on my exec team not just to have vertical expertise in the area that they managed, but they had better be coming with a point of view around the whole organization that then we would debate. I was clear on how the decision making process would arise though. Like this is about the debate and then I'm gonna make the call. This is not like a consensus, like some things maybe, but most wasn't. It was just like, I need this good debate and then here's the call. And, and being really clear on how you're gonna make the call, but you gotta go make that call. Uh, and so, you know, I think, it, and it depends on how you wanna build your exec team too. So, you know, I started out with 12 people. Uh, I shrunk it to seven and kept two. So, you know, there's oftentimes, like in the case of Open Table, I had to make a lot of changes. So it was a very different situation than all of you. But in order to change the company, I had to get the group in the room that I was, you know, wanted to have that environment. And when you also, I mean, you should think about the number of your direct reports. If you get to that point of view of like 12, 13 direct reports, you're having broadcast sessions, you're not having collaboration sessions. So there's no way that you're going to be able to have a good scrap with 12 people in the room. All right, thank you, Krista. Thanks.